Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. This is Tristan. He's a corgi. And this is an episode of Conversations with a Corgi. And today I have a very complex and probably long talk that I want to do to address an issue in the horse world. So if you have dogs, you might want to stop watching now or share this with your friends with horses. So there's been an issue going on in the horse world way back, um, even when I was just starting to learn about dressage and switching from hunters in the 80s and 90s. And just for some background information about me, if people don't know, I'm an advanced Tellington T-Touch practitioner for horses and dogs and people. And I am an FEI level dressage rider. I trained two of my horses to the FEI levels. They were Morgans, they did not cost $10,000 and I had the great fortune to work several years with Olympia and Lendon Gray with my horses as well as with Linda Tallington and uh, many other great trainers um, a few years ago. And so I then developed the craniosacral therapy work that I was learning for humans to be done with horses and to be done with small animals. So I have a tremendous background in this area to bring some expertise and to look at what I'm calling and many other people have too, the physiologic and also the craniosacral consequences of riding horses in over flexion at the pole, which is called roll cur. And it's a situation that if you're not familiar with it, if you're just a trail rider, good for you. So here is a horse on the cover of this book in this position with his head really pulled back towards his chest. He's way over flexed, his muscles standing out in his neck, his ears are uncomfortable. Look at the mouth, he, his eye is squinting, his nostril is pinched, and he has draw reins on him, which connect from the rider's hand to the horse's mouth to the girth to pull the head into this position. And this is not an uncommon, sadly, practice in the world of training horses in Western, in dressage, and even in some saddle seat people I've seen. So um, if you're not familiar with this, this will be an interesting talk for you. And if you are familiar with it, please do listen. So this book actually is by uh, Dr. Gerd Heuschmann. He has written three books now. This one's Tug of War, Classical versus Modern Dressage. And I just have a few things marked here to kind of further explain to you what is going on um, when this happens with a horse. So here is a very good picture. It's on page 89 in this book of the horse being over flexed. Look at the way the arrows are going on his skeletal structure. His head is being pulled down. His back is being stiffened. And then look at the result in the picture below. It's just like the one on the cover. The horse, sorry about the glare, the horse is pulled way in. Now look at the pole, which is the area behind the ears and under the neck between the jaws, because these are the areas that we're gonna be talking about more in great detail. And the result of riding this way leads to many um, problems in gait and um, performance. But here is an example of a horse being ridden this way. And I, interestingly, was looking at some of my model horses to find ones that give examples of this. And what I have is the Briar Cantering Welsh Pony model. Notice how much he looks like that picture we just saw. Look how stiff his neck and shoulders are. Look at that front leg. He's cantering and there's no flexion at all in that front leg that's towards you. And then I looked for one that had a more natural canter but still collected and we had gem twist. And see that reach in his front leg and how his head is relaxed at the pole. His back is up. He doesn't have any of that stiffness. So even our briar horses are telling us a better way to ride than roll cur. So let's look at what's going on physiologically and craniosacral therapy wise when a horse is being ridden this way. This whole conversation started because of um, a woman I know named Leslie Desmond, who is a well-known um, trainer and wrote um, a very long book that's pretty well known about her work with Bill Durance. 
And so I had made a comment on one of her Facebook lives about roll cur and overflexion at the pole um, in, uh, causing uh, eye problems and creating spooky horses. And she wrote a simple response saying, hey, tell me more about that. What is your reference? I want to know more. This is really interesting to me. And so I started a group email between myself, Linda Tellington Jones, and my colleague Tracy Broom out in Colorado, who also teaches um, course craniosacral therapy. So Linda Tellington's response was that since the 70s, she had noticed that spooky horses were often tight in their pole, um, and in that, especially the first two cervical vertebrae right here. And we have many models here. I have a whole thing here I have to manage. And she felt that the flexion there was creating pressure on the optic nerve, which of course would decrease circulation to the head, which then would cause all kinds of problems. Now, this is interesting because my sister, who is a vet, who works with dogs, um, I just happened to open a page of her book, Needles to Natural, and came to the page where she was talking about one of her own dogs, Laura, and she had brought her to a big thing in town and it was noisy and scary and she pulled at the collar so tightly that it raised her blood pressure and caused instant blindness. And so in fact, in our dogs, we have the same kind of thing going on with choke collars and prong collars and um, really thin little collars on a dog that's pulling instead of something wider. Um, really, all dogs need harnesses for the most part and there are a few good types that you can get to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And so her dog was blind from the increased pressure in the head, the increased blood pressure in the body from just pulling in absolute terror. Her dog did regain her sight, but not all the time does this happen. So high blood pressure can definitely lead to visual problems, um, usually glaucoma in humans. And so it's really important that we look at the relationship between the neck and the hyoid bone specifically in the neck and the junction with the neck and the cervical vertebrae and then the junction between the back of the head the occiput and the sphenoid bone which is in the head so i then um, continued to do some research and talk to tracy and uh, one of the things that she brought up which is super important regards the hyoid bone now I don't have a good picture of a horse hyoid bone but I have a good picture of a dog one and it is very similar sorry Tristan he's like these props are worrying me so right here there's a little L-shaped group of bones I don't know how well you can see it but that is the hyoid it's a hyoid apparatus it's sort of shaped like a spur actually and this picture over here may have it a little bit more clearly. It's right in front of my finger there. I don't know how well you can see it. But the hyoid is a really important bone. And honestly, in my first cranial class, when we learned a hyoid release, and you can find your own hyoid by putting your fingers right here, and then click your tongue on the roof of your mouth, and you'll feel it expand as you um, click your tongue. It'll come into your fingers. So it's pretty easy to find. So in cranial work, we have a really gentle release where you put your two fingers here, support the back of the head with your other hand, and just give it a little tiny nudge, not even the weight of a nickel, just a little tiny nudge, and then follow it as it unwinds. Now this was remarkable to me because the guy teaching my first cranial class when I learned this technique back in 1991, had we had a guy in our class who was a chiropractor, and he knew of someone who had been doing a manipulation, a chiropractor, and had broken that bone in a person. Now this is really a big deal because all of the muscles that attach to the hyoid move the tongue and are part of our swallowing. So having a happy, healthy, functioning hyoid is really critical. And remember, we've been talking about fascia and the hyoid is one of those places where a lot of the muscles and the fascia change directions. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure and strain on that hyoid. And if you do have some kind of a car accident with like a sideways whiplash and you get tension in the muscles on the side of the hyoid, it can really have broad reaching implications throughout your body. And so one of the things that happens when you have that horse flexed way in like this, you can even feel it on yourself, your hyoid comes out and then it 
actually impinges the ability to breathe. So the hyoid has attachments to the larynx, the pharynx, and the epiglottis, which is the bottom of your mouth. It anchors your tongue. A lot of animals, as we know, explore and know the world through taste and their mouths because they don't have hands. So this is very important with horses. And then it's also um, hanging on the skull by the stylohyoid ligaments. So it's hanging up inside. I have a skeleton model of a horse here. It does not have a hyoid, but you can see where the pink spot is there on his neck. That's where his tongue comes down and attaches. And then down here further, is he broken? Yeah, his trachea came off, but that's his trachea. It would come all the way up. Um, and attach here. And the hyoid bone is up underneath the jaw, just like it is on a human. And so if you flex that horse's nose down against his chest, he is not going to be able to breathe. He won't be able to move his tongue. We already know that tight nose bands restrict the movement of the tongue and causes great distress in horses. And Linda Tellington does relate a story about a horse owned by a very famous dressage rider in Germany who was uh, kind of retired because he wasn't doing well and he had a very, very tight nose band, as do many people over tighten the nose band. And so the horse was sort of put in retirement. Um, someone else started riding the horse just casually and didn't tighten the nose band, didn't even use a nose band every day. And then began to start working with the horse in the ring and noticed exceptional performance. And that was because the nose band had been restricting the breathing in the nostrils and the movement of the tongue and the mouth. And the horse was tense. And that tension translates to being in that fight flight response. And so you cannot perform under those circumstances. We all know that. We've all had that calculus teacher that threw chalk at us when we got the wrong answer. And we definitely could not think of the right answer in that moment. So the hyoid is a big factor in what's going on when you overflex a horse at the pole like that. So that flexion causes a constant contraction on the hyoid and the muscles up to the tongue. It can cause um, problems in the airway. The horse can't breathe. If you hold your head like this, you can't take a deep breath. You can, if you breathe through your nostrils, it gets stuck in the back of your throat. So think about that when you're pulling a horse's head in like that. Also, over time, from being ridden this way, scar tissue can develop. And, you know, the horse will never be able to find that modulation between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, that's the, the relationship between the rest digest state, the parasympathetic piece, and the sympathetic state, which is high stress. So if your head's always like this, you have a really hard time getting out of that um, tension from the stress and that's something that people have trouble with we have higher cortisol levels all kinds of GI problems all kinds of immune problems because we are stuck in that stress mode we can't relax because of drinking coffee uh, drinking alcohol our high stress world we've lost our ability to modulate that which is one reason we connect with our animals so much because animals are able to go oh my god terrifying oh no it's just a false alarm okay back to eating we don't do that so well. And you're not letting a horse do that if you ride him in this contracted, um, roll cur, overflexed situation because he cannot get a full breath. So the pterygoid muscles connect the hyoid to the sphenoid. And the sphenoid is a bone in the head. I don't have the horse model here, I just have a human. Um, but m the eye motor nerves go through the sphenoid. If you look in here, that red bone, it looks sort of like a bat in the center here. That red bone is the sphenoid and it has little holes in it for the eye motor nerves. While we're looking at it, let's also notice the very center of it down here. In the center, we're going to get attachments for the horizontal and vertical membranes of the head, which this model represents. This is in the brain and it divides the brain into compartments. It fits in the head this way. And so all of that attaches, this nose end attaches on the sphenoid. So the sphenoid is important from that regard as well. So now you have the pterygoid muscles going from the hyoid to the sphenoid, and that's going to cause a lot of tension at that junction between the sphenoid and the occiput, which is the blue bone here, right down here, this junction. Now this junction 
and craniosacral therapy um, developed by Sutherland is really the, the beginning of the movement that is our life. Those two bones are connected, and I don't have a model separate, but there's a rocking motion there that is part of the movement of the spinal fluid from the brain down the back to the sacrum and back up. And I have a wonderful video, but it's really gruesome in some ways of what happens if that joint is just off by a tiny bit this way, this way, rotated this way. The ramifications throughout the body are profound. So having the horse flex like this is going to make profound problems in the body because of those pterygoid muscles connecting the hyoid to the sphenoid. And then of course the imotor nerves go through the sphenoid. And if the sphenoid gets shifted so that it's like this or like this, because so often when those horses are overflexed, they're tilting to one side or locking their jaw on one side to try to avoid the tension. So that's gonna create a problem on the eye motor nerves and then the horse is gonna seem spooky in addition to which he can't breathe because he can't expand in his trachea to get air in. The other interesting thing is that the vagus nerve, which is one of the most important nerves in the body to modulate that balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, the um, vagus nerve runs out through the occiput. See that hole in the blue one? That is where the vagus nerve runs out. Does that in horses, dogs, people. And the vagus nerve, if that has tension on it over time or repeatedly um, from being in this flex position, like our poor little cantering Welsh pony here, if that is flexed over a long period of time right here in the pole, that vagus nerve is getting tweaked and stretched and not allowed to relax, which causes increased anxiety, of course, because you're in that stress um, response, increased inflammation throughout the body as a result of being in that stress response. And then you also have gastric upset. And we see so many horses now with ulcers. And this is one of the reasons why. You don't have to ride a horse very long like this to create these kinds of problems. And certainly when I was at a big barn that was in the saddle seat world, they used bidding rigs on horses to hold their heads like this. Now, they don't ask them to try to lift their backs. Their backs are allowed to drop and that gives them a little bit of relief. But when you're standing in a stall for hours in a bidding apparatus, or um, I've seen Western riders tie things, heavy things under their horses' necks to hold them like this, it's not creating any good physiologic responses in the body and you can end up having ulcers and inflammation and cancer, increased incidences in gray horses in particular because they're already prone to that. And then of course the anxiety, which is not leading you to a quiet horse who's not spooking, which remember was our original question, how does this create a spooky horse, this flexed pole? So the other thing that comes about from this flex position is that you end up getting restriction in the shoulders and the forelimbs and you get the cantering Welsh pony here. See that stiff front leg? And it leads to gait changes and that's because of the muscles that connect from the sternum down underneath the horse's chest. Let me see if this guy has a sternum. I think he does. He might try to lose his tail. Ah. Well, he has a bit of a sternum in there. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. But muscles connect from that sternum all the way up his neck here to the hyoid. So if the hyoid is bent into this position, it's really causing those muscles a lot of dysfunction and tension. Now we know from my physical therapy world that muscles that are held in a certain position for a long period of time, like with the head like this, developed overstretched on one side and overstrength on the other side. And it's almost impossible to fix them and straighten out the bottom side and make it flexible and shorten up the top side and make it strong. And this is what happens after you have your broken arm. You know, you've got all these muscles tight on the inside and stretched on the outside and you've got to get them back to a balance with each other. So what you're causing here is like a structural imbalance in the horse's anatomy, in his bony structure and his muscular structure, which does result in an emotional and mental and behavior um, unbalance in the rest of him. So um, you'll end up with a hollow back. Notice this little guy, his back is very hollow right here. It looks straight, but it's not really. And then the other thing that happens is with the pelvis. You want in a dressage horse 
or actually any horse that you're riding, you want the, the hind end to stay under the horse because that's the motor. You can see from him that his hind legs are a little bit trailing behind him and that's because of this angle in his pelvis. If we look at Jim Twist, he has his pelvis is able to go down because he's not overflexed here and now he can reach under. Look at those hind legs. This is why this horse was such a great jumper because he was ridden correctly. So you get that fluid forward motion with the muscles um, if you don't have that overflexion. If you do have that flexion, you get the hollow back, the tipped pelvis, and you end up with compromised gait. And I think there's a picture of that in here, which I had flagged. Yeah, this guy that I showed you at first. See how he's overflexed? And look how flat his sacrum and the lumbar vertebrae are and his whole top line. He cannot get his hind end under him. He's going to lose impulsion. He's going to end up on the forehand like our cantering Welsh pony, and he will not be able to use his body effectively or correctly. And then what are we doing with these poor dressage horses? We're asking them to do movements that are at the highest level of physical ability for a horse. So what are the results of all of this compromise um, that we're causing by overflexing at the pole? Well, we're losing range of motion in the front legs. The horse can't reach out. Look at the difference between Gem Twist and Cantering Welsh Pony. Gem Twist has a much bigger stride. See how his shoulder's reaching forward? Cantering Welsh Pony has that stiff little reach, lack of reach. So you don't have movement, free movement in the front legs. They can't freely swing their scapula forward. It can't glide if they have all that restriction happening up in the hyoid. Then the horse is taking a shallow breath, which caused them to be in that fight flight mode. If you have no idea what that really is about, try holding your breath and taking little short breaths for a couple of minutes. It'll make you lightheaded, you won't feel good, and you'll be desperate to get air. So we're definitely impairing a horse's ability to breathe when we have them in that roll curve position. The second thing is that you get the pole flexion and it creates that hollow back. And that hollow back, neither of these guys are a good example of that, but there was a, a briar horse called the old timer and he had a little suede back. That's a really good example of a hollow back. Now the hollow back is related to tension in the dura. So what's the dura? Okay, we have the head, we have the spinal cord, which is the yellow rubber band, and then we have the sacrum. That is the dural tube. That dura goes all the way from the horse's head all the way to his butt. And there's a movement here, back and forth. Flexion and extension in craniosacral terms. Now, where does this dura go when it gets up to the occiput? It attaches to my other model here. Okay, so this is part of the brain, this little model. We have the horizontal membrane here, the fox, and then we have the tentorium, which is, a, I mean, this is the vertical membrane. This is the horizontal membrane here, which is the tentorium, because it looks a little like a tent. <laughs> and then the sphenoid sits underneath of there, and this whole thing attaches to the sphenoid here. So if I am pulling, if I have a lot of tension on the dura, because I have my head down like this, and it's you know, at a normal standing position, it's more like this. If I put my head down, now I have tension on the dural tube. That tension is going to go up through the falx in the tent into the brain and create a headache for a horse, um, among other things. In addition to which, you're going to have the same kind of... Um, now this tissue, and I have beautiful pictures of this, but they're on the computer, so I can't bring them in here. In your brain, this membrane really doesn't look, actually this is a good example, it doesn't look much different than, than this TheraBand. Now notice this TheraBand has a couple of holes in it and see how it's stuck right here? That is actually what the brain membranes start to look like with a kind of tension over a long period of time. You'll see this with somebody with scoliosis, you'll see this with somebody with major structural changes after a car accident, even a hard fall on the sacrum. And you'll start to get little tears I mean, this is a big, heavy plastic model, but this is really delicate, light stuff. I've dissected it many times. And you'll start to get these restrictions, like I've talked about with the fascia, where there's like these white, 
striations where it's not any longer see-through and you'll see little holes in it if the if the tension has been bad enough why does that matter because all the important structures in the brain are supported and surrounded by the fox in the tent and then also in here we have this articulates with all the bones of the skull so all of the processes that go on in the brain are going to be interrupted by this tension on the dural tube and the the dura in the brain and so you're going to have things like thyroid problems because the thyroid lives right here in the cella turcica in the middle of this red sphenoid bone and <clears throat> not the thyroid the pituitary gland sorry i'm thinking about the thyroid from a dog thing <laughs> the pituitary gland lives there and the pituitary gland is the master gland and so if he's interrupted all the other systems of the body are going to be interrupted you're going to end up with all kinds of problems for your horse and you'll have less circulation to the brain that's not a good thing for anybody so having those plaques developing in the brain again this is going to relate to the eye um, having that tension where the dural tube attaches through this into the red bone in there the sphenoid that tension here is going to tip the sphenoid and again strain the eye motor nerves they are also going to do the same thing as your arm when you break it they're going to be stretched on one side and tight on the other or uh, loose on the other they're not going to be able to move and so it's going to not only because these are your eye motor nerves as well as some of your other nerves that go to your eye you're not going to be able to move your eye very well and you're not going to be able to see very well so that's a huge problem for the horse or for any animal that's got extreme flexion at the pole. So the, the cranial nerves are just the least of that. And then on the energetic level, let's look at this because we've done so many talks about the chakras. You've got, come here, horsey. We'll use this guy. Actually, we'll use this guy. Sorry, Tristan. Oh, we gotta reach far. Oh, I need a corgi's, corgi down. <laughs> okay, so this guy is actually in a functional position. But let's look at what this is doing to the chakras. You've got the throat chakra here. You've got the crown chakra here and the third eye here. So those chakras will also be interrupted in their function by having this overflexion like cantering Welsh pony. And cantering Welsh pony is not that bad. Usually they're much worse. The nose is much closer to the chest. So you can see here just the amount of tension that this will cause. Now, what are these chakras? We've got our connection to the divine through the crown chakra that's our that's our connection to god we've got the third eye which is our intuition our creativity and our throat chakra which is to give us voice to give us an ability to express ourselves so all of those will be impacted by riding a horse in this overflex position and so that does him no service to his nature it's very disrespectful of his um, the wonderful things that, that we admire and love about horses. To ride him with his nose against his chest, like in this picture that we started with on Gerd's book, is you know, beyond, beyond mean. I mean, it really is compromising the essential essence of a horse. And it's taking from him all the things that we love and appreciate and what brought us to horses in the first place. That beautiful fluid movement that we love about them that made us want to ride them and be part of them. We are taking that away from them when we ride them like this. And so I think that is, there is a good picture near the end here. Two pictures. Okay, this bottom picture here. The horse is doing a piaf. You can see that he's swishing his tail. Look at all the tension in his neck and the overdevelopment of those muscles. Look how his legs are positioned under him. And then we have the happy piaf. See, notice how his pelvis is up. The buckskin's pelvis is down and he is doing a happy piaf. He is rhythmic, he is balanced. His legs are one in each corner. His head is relaxed. He still has his nose at a vertical, a little bit tipped out at the, no the nostril end, but that's, that's proper. That's what we see in the Spanish riding school when you go watch the Lipizzans. You do not see this. See how his nose is behind the vertical? And I once judged a fun dressage show around here, 
and it was actually a, a little event. And I gave heavy penalties for overflexion at the pole, um, and that was within the guidelines on the rules for each of the movements in the dressage test. And there was one person there who has been riding their horse overflexed for a number of years, and probably still does if they're still riding, and they were very upset with me. They, they were well out of the ribbons with my placement and they had thought that they were really good. And they had an instructor who was telling them they were really good, which was not doing them any help because the instructor was just as wrong as they were. And the horses that were in the top six positions were being ridden beautifully. I mean, they were doing like training in first level dressage tests. You should see a horse looking more like Gem Twist at that level. He should not have his nose against his chest. Now, Gem Twist can easily bring his nose a little more uh, vertical here without overflexing and still be in this correct and proper balance. And so <clears throat> it created a bit of controversy. I had to do a big lunch break lecture and intervention, and I have not been invited back to judge at that place since then. <laughs> and I'm not surprised because that person, I think, was riding with someone at that farm where I was doing the show, um, and so that was a big problem. But the other riders were lovely, and it's always nice for me to see that with eventing riders because they are asking their horses to jump as well, and you really need a high-functioning horse with um, a good anatomical alignment, to be able to jump at his best, which is why Jem Twist looks so good here. He's a great jumper. He's one of the best jumpers we've ever known. And so that is an overview of the physiological and craniosacral implications of riding a horse in roll cur. And I hope this was clear for people. Danny, you'll let me know. For people that may know a lot about horses or not so much, or people that know a lot about anatomy or not so much, because these are really important considerations when we're looking at the way we ride horses and what we ask them to do. Our lives with them are really interrupted by the way we ride them. And not everyone takes the time to take their horse for a beautiful trail ride through the woods. It's a snowy day, it's fairly warm out. It's a wonderful day to take a ride. And not every horse is going to get that opportunity. So many of them are going to be running in circles, in a ring, sometimes in one direction more than the other, and all too often with their head pulled back against their chest. And this is just a real disservice to horses, in my opinion. And I, I hope that I am able to um, at least give people something to think about um, when they're selecting a trainer or selecting a horse or at a show or just going to a farm and watching people work their horses. So please write to me any questions you have and I will get back to you all and please share this with your horse friends. Thanks for joining us today. This has been another episode of Conversations with a Corgi. I don't even know what I'm gonna title this <laughs> so that people will know what it's about, but we'll figure that out in the next 20 minutes. So we will, I'll be at my job as an educator on Monday and Wednesday this week. So we'll be back with another episode of Conversations with a Corgi on Tuesday. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day. I tried to give Tristan his own chair because of all the models, but he wanted to be on my lap still. And he's wearing his bow tie because he wanted to look like the professor of anatomy that he is. He says, yeah, look at my good head movement. I can move my eyes. I can look everywhere. I can move my tongue because my hyoid's happy. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Be kind to your animals and yourself.